Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. And go and get that quintessential drink, whatever it is you like drinking. And if it's something on the unusual side, you know the rules. You need to tell me about it. So don't forget to do so, because I do enjoy hearing from you. But before we get started, I'd like to remind you that this is part two of our story because it was so long it had to be divided into two parts. So if you haven't heard part one, I will literally attach it here to the link. So go back to part one to hear it before you continue on to part two. You might want to remind yourself by listening to part one again. That's not a bad idea either. But for those of you who want to be refreshed, I just will tell you that basically what's happened is we have a young man who whose best friend has cheated on his sister and he's very, very upset about it. And they've gone together on a hunting retreat and somehow they get caught up in a heated argument about what his best friend had done to his sister because he was very aggrieved about it. And there were two hunters who witnessed this altercation and lost out on the hunt as a result. So let's get back to the story. What's going on here? We were in a stand a short way away from here. We were this close to getting a deer, let me tell you. With our rifles, said the man using his fingers to indicate a hair's breath. We were about to fire at a marvellous looking deer. And the sound of the two of you screaming the woodgrove down like a couple of deranged banshees rattled them considerably. They ran away like grease lightning. They won't be coming back in a hurry. So we lost our quarry. Thanks a bunch. We've been waiting all morning for the perfect shot. Then the two of you startle all the deer with your raucous row. We've been staying at the lodge for over three days now. And the moment we're about to take down a real beauty with the kind of humongous antlers every aspiring hunter longs for, the two of you ruin everything for us. I hope you're jolly well pleased with yourselves. Sorry, I said. We didn't know you were so close by. It was rather unfortunate. That's not the point, mate. I don't give a toss about your apology anyway. It's far too late for that. Water under the bridge, so to speak, said one of the British chaps. Everyone knows the social etiquette when you're on a hunting retreat. You keep bloody quiet. Those are the rules. You've spoilt our quintessential opportunity to take down a perfect specimen today with your selfish, apathetic indifference, by announcing our human presence to all the wild animals out here. We're going to have to move far away from the spot that you totaled for us so inauspiciously. I'm sorry, I said, but me and Thomas here, we have some issues we need to address between us. We can see that, but this is not the place for you to have a row. Why on earth would two people have a bloody fight in the middle of a wood grove when you're supposed to be bloody quiet? It's ludicrously nonsensical. We both expressed our apologies to the hunters who announced they were going further afield. Make sure you don't go to the right, they warned us, or we won't be responsible for our actions. If you sabotage another golden opportunity for us to strike it lucky. Word of advice, keep your trap shut. I'm sorry, mate, I said to Thomas. I've completely wrecked the hunt for the both of us by lashing out at you so inconsiderately. I really must apologise. This was not the right place for us to air our dirty laundry to all and sundry, even if the wild animals received the benefit of all of it. I guess I've been angry for a long while. I lost it by blowing up. Forget about it, said Thomas. I don't know about you, but I'd rather sit by the watering hole and enjoy our picnic together. Forget about the hunt. In truth, I'm just glad to be with you, bro, enjoying this beautiful day. It's never really about the hunt anyway. It's just good to be together. That's what it's all about, comradeship. So we did just that, gathering the picnic basket and our hunting gear and finding a comfortable spot close to the watering hole to enjoy our picnic, rifles at the ready. If by any chance we might just strike it lucky, but that was exceedingly unlikely after our loud brawl. You know what, bro? 
I'm so glad you let off steam. It's very good to get your feelings out, I find. By the way, you are absolutely right. I'm completely responsible for my abysmal behaviour at the barbecue. I was using the alcohol as an excuse. The reality is I behaved atrociously, and I feel very, very ashamed of my actions. I am truly, truly sorry. If I could go back in time, I would change everything if I could. I beg you, Oliver, please don't let this ruin our friendship. You are my best friend. You're like my brother. My heart softened towards Oliver. We both embraced. I forgive you. I feel the same. You're like a brother to me. Remember I warned you not to get involved with Pamela. I had a sense that something like this would happen. But it's my sister you need to apologise to, not me. There is no time like the present, he said. I'm going to SMS her right now, he said, tapping into his phone and sending her a message. What did you say, I asked. Never you mind, he said, his eyes twinkling. I just want to sort this all out. If you must know, I told her I love her. I took ownership of what I did, although I doubt we can ever rekindle the flame after what I did. But I want her to know how truly sorry I am. In a trice, me and Thomas stopped eating, almost as if the food froze in our mouths. I don't know how to put it in words to you, but we both sensed that the forest had changed significantly. That was when we both realised that the pretty bird song had been vanquished, as if the birds themselves had withdrawn from their singing. The forest became bodeful, pretentious, menacing, as if the energy or congenial atmosphere had shifted substantially. I could feel prickles running down my spine, and glanced at Thomas, who looked at me with wide eyes that glinted with a pronounced look of trepidation. Even without words, we both knew something was terribly wrong. But what? All I can say is that the forest became very quiet. So hushed, in fact, that you could have heard a pin drop. The mute sound of silence took possession of the entire forest like an aggressive hijacker, commanding every tree, every blade of grass, every fern, every flower, every bird and animal, into an acquiescent compliant submission. It was as if fear rose up into every living thing, enforcing its tight control, so even the trees seemed to freeze up in terror. That was when we heard the thunderous noise. It sounded like something very weighty, very substantial, very mighty. It was moving through the forest, the kind of clamorous footfall you'd invariably expect to hear from a sizable elephant. Only this strident footfall was definitely bipedal. But with every pronounced step, the ground boomed, crashed, thundered, heaved and vibrated, as if the earth beneath these feet was like a hollow drum. But whatever this thing was, his movements were cautiously slow and deliberate, almost as if every footstep was carefully considered and contemplated. Whatever was coming our way, I knew had to be a hell of a big. It seemed outer-worldly, as whatever it was appeared to be both mysteriously enigmatic to our reality. You would have thought that Thomas and I would quickly try to gather our senses together and get out of this place as fast as a jack hare. But sometimes in precarious situations like this, you act irrationally, vacillate and waver with an irresolute uncertainty, as your mind tries to adjust to the changes in your environment with a great deal of difficulty. I think frozen would be the perfect word to describe our instincts, for we seem to be superglued to our picnic spot, subdued by this incredible ominous presence looming ever closer towards us. Thomas grabbed his rifle holding on to it for dear life, as if he was afraid to let go. I, on the other hand, remained fixed to the spot, like one of the moss-covered rocks in the earthen floor. For a while the footsteps suddenly stopped, but I could feel the remarkable presence of something weighty, something incredibly big. But how big, I couldn't be sure. Then me and Thomas felt eyes on us. You almost certainly know when someone is staring or leering at you and these eyes seemed to sear through us like burning hot coals. Thomas was putting his fingers on his lips and bent his head down low with his rifle at the ready. 
Suddenly we could see a tenebous shadowy movement running from tree to tree. Then with one mighty powerful bang, a tall ponderosa pine tree came crashing down to the ground, causing me to literally jump out of my skin. It landed with one hell of a mighty crash. Then we saw him. He was standing only yards away from us. I stared at the creature in an obsequious, abject horror, my eyes trying to assimilate the full gravity of what I was beholding, as if I couldn't quite grasp what I was in fact discerning. It was as if some monstrous creature from a fictional book had morphed into our subsistence. But this creature was not fictitious in any way. It was real, dauntingly so. I knew at once that this was in fact a Bigfoot. It was hard to grasp that such a critter that I'd never believed could exist here in North America was a factuality, like you or me. It stood up, lofty, exalted, dignified, majestic, puissant, on two thunderous tree-trunk-sized legs, at about seven foot tall, possibly six hundred pounds or even more. He was built like a piece of heavy farming machinery. He was burly, with potent muscular definition. Shoulders so explosively strong, they would invariably make an NFL player's shoulder pads look ridiculously silly, even pathetic. This idiosyncratic novel creature looked human, with remarkable ape-like influences. He had deep-set dark eyes, the colour of liquid treacle, that sparkled brightly, high cheekbones, a sloped, heavily furrowed forehead, a flat aquatic nose with two large open slits a very pronounced square jawline. He was staring at us with an inquisitive curiosity, a measure of significant interest. In that moment, he seemed remarkably non-threatening, but even so, I was petrified. It's like seeing a creature that is incredibly intimidating, that although it might appear benevolent or benign, you can never be quite sure if he might suddenly turn aggressive, like a threatening breed of dog, that you've been assured is friendly by the owner but the reverse is found to be true. So you oscillate and waver with a tentative uncertainty about what you should do in the circumstances as you quickly contemplate how to react. But I'm afraid the ever impulsive, spontaneous Thomas didn't see it like that. He was shaking like a leaf. Oh my God, he whispered. What the heck? This thing, this thing is going to bloody kill us. The next thing I knew, before I could restrain my best friend, Thomas had fired a shot at the creature, and it landed directly in his arm. This was not Thomas's finest thinking moment. The Bigfoot swatted the bullet like an angry mosquito bite. The problem with Thomas is that in his fear he acted impulsively before he took stock of the situation. Firing at the Bigfoot had not been a wise, sagacious move on his part. The next thing I knew was all hell broke loose, as the affronted Bigfoot was now exceedingly piqued and offended. He seemed maligned and provoked by the attack, feeling like he'd been unfairly wronged. He suddenly grabbed Thomas's rifle from him, bending it like a malleable toy, and with one hand he tossed it into the forest, where it landed with an almighty thump somewhere. The nettled Bigfoot then grabbed Thomas with his sizable hands, so that Thomas was looking directly into his eyes. The Bigfoot slapped Thomas once on the head, as if to say, Get a grip! Don't you go shooting at me, young man! I truly don't think he meant to hit Thomas hard, but Thomas literally stumbled on the floor in a crumpled heap. The Bigfoot bent over to examine my friend. I kid you not, he was genuinely upset. His fingers went into his mouth. It was almost as if he was biting his nails apprehensively, as if he had come to the horrifying revelation of the gravity of what he'd done. He looked up at me with dark eyes filled with remorse and regret. I felt the words in my head. I didn't mean to, but he tried to hurt me. He said this pointing to his arm that was bleeding a little. It was clear he would live. The wound was like a graze on the knee to him. I don't know what possessed me, but I ran over to my friend. I tried desperately to wake Thomas up, not even considering my own safety. I felt for a pulse, but there was nothing. I was standing so close to the Bigfoot he could have reached out and touched me. When I looked up into his deep-set dark eyes, I realised they were incredibly kind, but very sad, very regretful. I realised then, without a shadow of a doubt, that this creature had just been curiously inquisitive about us. That was his only crime.
Undeniably, if Thomas had not reacted in this inappropriate way, he would still be very much alive. It was a sobering thought. I was almost angry with him for always being so damn capriciously incautious and injudiciously impetuous. I looked at the Bigfoot and felt genuine compassion for him. He was visibly distressed. I said to him, It's not your fault. It was an accident. Once again the words came into my head. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't know he was so fragile. I knew that my friend Thomas was dead. I couldn't believe one hit from the Bigfoot's hand had done this to him. But then I imagined the creature was simply not aware of his own strength. I did get the impression that despite his huge size, he was young and inexperienced as a Bigfoot. Perhaps he wasn't aware of his own power. A little bit like a big dog, oblivious to his great size and the potential damage he could do. The creature grunted a few times and then glided away and was gone. In a trice the bird song returned to the woods, and then I began to sob and sob and sob over the loss of my very best friend. Before long I found myself at a police station being interviewed and interrogated by two officers that were literally accusing me of murdering my best friend. I was taken into a pedestrian, very beige-looking room that was small and pokey with hard chairs and a small interview table. I could immediately sense both these men were champing at the bit to get a confession out of me. I was in no doubt that they really believed I was guilty of murdering my best friend. I was already emotionally distraught, but being interrogated by these two belligerent men made me feel like a teacup poodle being bullied by two very determined Rottweilers who were champing at the bit to get a confession out of me. I was a person with no history of violent crime, but they were jumping at straws, absolutely convinced, even before questioning me, that I was guilty as charged. I was asked if I needed my lawyer present. I said that that would not be necessary, but as the interview progressed, I began to seriously wonder if I had made the right choice in that regard. Could I be forced into a false confession, I wondered. Both the officers cross-examining me were big, sizable men, hardened professionals, very good at what they did. The kind of men exceedingly passionate about their jobs and fully determined to get results at any cost. Officer Markham spoke first. He rubbed his walrus moustache reflectively and said, We interviewed the two British men that were hunting that day with you. They tell me, Oliver, that you ruined their hunt. One of the men, called Toby Willington, was a very helpful man. He said he was about to fire a shot at a very sizable deer. But the thing scampered away, as your two very loud voices were screaming at each other. You could be heard so loudly, scaring every animal within hearing distance. He said you were having an inflamed argument. And it got very well, let's just say, heated. One of the men said he heard you saying to your friend, you wished you could kill him. I don't deny that, I said. I wished I could kill him. It's true, I said to the officers. Me and Thomas, we go back a long time. We're the very best of friends. He's like a brother to me. Well, what was this fight about, said the officer, looking at me with a cynical raised brow. Why did you say you wished you could kill him? I did not mean it, literally. It was what I said in the heat of the moment. I didn't actually mean it. You say things when you're angry at times, especially when you're comfortable with someone like I am with Thomas. How many stroppy teenagers officers have told their parents they wish they were dead or that they hate them? It's the same thing. They didn't mean a word of it. I suppose it's what you call dramatic free expression. Tell me something. Do you get angry often, Oliver? asked the officer. Are you prone to violent outbursts? Absolutely not, officer, I insisted. Not at all. You can ask anyone who knows me. I'm very easy going, actually, if you must know. So then why were you so angry with Thomas? I was angry with him, officer, because he was dating my sister. He cheated on her. I'm very protective over my younger sister. Naturally, I was infuriated with him for what he did. When I saw him again, it was after a month of no interaction with him. But I was still so pissed off with him. 
how he hurt my sister. It's hard to forgive. I put it to you, Oliver, that you were very aggrieved about Thomas's betrayal of your sister. You surreptitiously lured him into the woodgrove for some hunting, when you had in mind that you would hit him over the head with a rock or something, and blame it on a bear. How convenient, if you ask me. I think you were very, very angry about what he had done to your sister. You were determined to murder him in cold blood, to extract your ultimate revenge. What do you have to say about that, Oliver? Oh my God, I thought. These two officers seriously believed I killed my very best friend. How am I ever going to explain what actually happened to Thomas? I knew I had to surreptitiously weave or incorporate some clever white lies or ingenious fabrications to my seemingly erroneous story to the officers. There was no way on God's earth I would be foolish or silly enough to spill the beans about what actually happened and about our encounter with the anomalous Bigfoot. I mean, how could I? It would mean risking sounding like someone who was completely deranged or cookie or off their head. For if I was wearing their shoes, I would certainly come to a similar conclusion. The worst part of it all was I was a terrible liar. How on earth was I going to navigate my way through this without looking incredibly guilty in the process? I told you, I said. I was answering a call of nature behind a large tree, if you must know. I left Thomas alone for a while at the picnic spot by the lake. By this stage, me and Thomas had made up. We were friends again. If you don't believe me, Thomas SMSed my sister to fully apologise for what he'd done to her and to tell her he still loved her. I think that is proof enough that we had made up again by this stage. The officer wrote down my comments. We will check that out with the sister. But even if you did make up with Thomas, I put it to you, Oliver, that you were still very hot under the collar. The fight could have been rekindled all over again. You are wrong about that, officer. You're jumping to all kinds of ridiculous conclusions if you don't mind my saying so. I can assure you our fight was over. All was forgiven and forgotten. We had reached a point where we realised how important our friendship was to each other. I am completely devastated to have lost my best friend. Frankly, officers, I am offended you think so little of me, that I would be capable of harming my best friend. Why, the very idea is completely insane. Well, get back to your story, Oliver, will you? You say you were answering a call of nature. Thomas was left alone at your picnic spot by the lake. You were behind a tree relieving yourself. What happened next? Well, I remember hearing Thomas yell. He fired a shot. I saw this big black shadowy thing darting away, which I assumed had to be a black bear. I mean, what else could it be, officer? Then I discovered Thomas lying there dead. I watched the two officers surreptitiously make eye contact with each other as brown eyes met blue briefly. I knew exactly what they were thinking. I was definitely telling Porky Pies as far as they were concerned. I could see that knowing look in their eyes as if they hadn't believed a single word of my account. Of course they were right. I had lied, but I tried to incorporate the truth within a lie. And it wasn't going well, not at all. My heart sank like a rock plundering to the bottom of a large lake. I was digging myself into a big hole. My heart began to thunder in my chest. I could hear every discernible audible beat. My cheeks flushed brightly, as if I was guilty of this duplicitous crime. Even my fingers began to tremble, while my knee began to involuntary shake. I could see gloomy, depressing pictures from a bleak, desolate future tormenting and traumatising me in my mind, rather like a bright, flashing, demoralising black-and-white slideshow. I could glimpse at myself through a crack in this future, stuck in a miserable prison cell, in the confines of a tiny, uncomfortable bed, with an obnoxious cellmate who was beating me up all the time. This was a horrifying revelation to me. It dawned on me that I could be falsely accused of an insidious crime that I did not commit. 
unfairly locked away in a prison cell for life. You heard about it all the time. Innocent people being charged with murder, a murder that they never committed. I could see how easily this could happen to me. The two officers looked as if they were fully satisfied that I was completely guilty of killing Thomas. But the only thing I was blameworthy of was being terrified of being falsely accused of my friend's abrupt, inadvertent death. So, Oliver, said the officer, staring at me judiciously through his very observant brown eyes, you really think we're going to buy your insane, ludicrous story that your best friend, who you so happen to have an altercation with in the heart of the woodgrove, is hit on the head by a bear with one fatal blow? Then the bear simply glides away, and you find your friend conveniently dead. Things pan out very differently in a bear attack, I assure you, Oliver. If they feel threatened, they attack the face many times, not just once. I quickly intervened and piped. Not everything is textbook, officer, I assure you. Life is full of surprises, as is the natural world. No two people act the same, and it's surely the case for bears too. If the person is no longer a threat, because they are dead, surely the bear would just leave, wouldn't she? Maybe the bear hit Thomas one time, he dropped down dead. The bear was fully satisfied that Thomas was no longer a threat. Maybe a mother bear watching over her cubs. Who knows? It happens. It's not beyond the realms of impossibility. Why not one blow to the head, I ask you? The officers looked at each other in exasperation. Then there was an unexpected knock at the door. A female police officer stood in the doorway. She said, Mrs. Hardings is here, Officer Markham. She's most insistent that she has to talk to you at once, this very minute. Very well, said the officer. You're free to go now, Oliver. But we will be speaking to you again shortly. You're not going to detain me, I asked, looking surprised. Not at the moment, Oliver. But I would watch my back if I were you. We haven't finished with you yet. Not by a long shot. Mrs. Hardings was not the kind of woman the officers were expecting to encounter by any manner of means. Even though she was suffering the grievous loss of her son, she appeared to be the most level-headed, pragmatic and practical woman the officers had ever met. She was also incandescent. This elegant woman wearing a navy blue tunic dress, golden sandals and a leather necklace with a golden coiled sculptural pendant at the end took her seat at the interview table opposite the officers. Officer Markham noticed the woman's makeup was immaculate. Her blonde hair was tied back in a neat ponytail with a leather bow. He had seen many bereaved parents before, but Mrs. Markham did not seem like any of them. She seemed remarkably in control of her emotions. But then again, people did grieve in different ways, didn't they? We are very sorry for your loss, madam, said Officer Markham. I would like to assure you we are doing everything in our power to investigate this crime. What makes you think this is a crime? demanded Mrs. Harding, looking directly at the officers with such a fierce look that they both grimaced. You heard what Oliver told you, did you not? It was a bear that killed my son. So why are you not taking him at his word? That's what I want to know. Well, the coroner's report does say that there was a blunt force injury to the head. There were two witnesses who heard your son and his friend Oliver in a heated brawl together. It's a distinct possibility he may have lashed out at his friend, hit him on the head, even if it was accidental. We have to investigate every avenue, otherwise we would not be doing our jobs correctly. You call yourself police officers, scoffed Mrs. Harding. The two of you are an absolute joke. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Didn't even cross your mind for a single moment to examine the character of Oliver before you start jumping to all kinds of ridiculous conclusions. For your information, Oliver is like a second son to me. I love the bones of that boy, as if he was my very own. That boy is one of the kindest, most gentle souls I have ever met in my entire life. 
He isn't even capable of swatting a fly, let alone killing a person. He is incapable of hurting anyone. It is not in his blood. I've known him since he was seven. I remember one time, officers, when some boys were trying to pull the legs off a little frog. Oliver was absolutely mortified about that. He grabbed the frog from those unsuspecting boys, running away with it and popping it into the nearest pond. Eventually those boys caught up with him. They beat him up really badly until he was black and blue. But he didn't care about that. He had saved that frog. That was all that mattered in his book. Oliver, officers, is like a rare diamond. They don't make them like him any more. Both the officers seemed genuinely moved by the story. So you really think he's incapable of physical violence, even in a heated argument? I absolutely knew without a shadow of a doubt that it would happen. But sometimes you need to hurt before you heal. I'll say this, though. It would never, and I repeat, never have turned physical. So you organised this hunt? asked Officer Markham, looking rather surprised. Oh, of course I did. Someone had to do something. It was a train smash waiting to happen when Thomas got involved with Oliver's sister, because Oliver was naturally going to get very upset if Thomas hurt his sister. He's very protective over little Pamela. I remember he visited me, begged me to try and put a stop to the relationship. He was terrified of things going wrong between Thomas and his sister, so that they would end up hating each other. Oliver has always been astute like that. He could see the writing on the wall. He could see it wasn't a good idea. There was too much to lose. It was me that phoned Oliver up. I was the one that persuaded him that life was way too short and that he and Thomas needed to repair their differences and forgive each other. He agreed with me. He thought the hunt was a great idea. I organised the two of them to go on the hunt together. I anticipated that they would have a heated altercation, but I knew that that would potentially be a great thing. Well, I must say, when we interviewed Oliver, he became rather nervous. His body language looked distinctly guilty under cross-examination. Well, imagine what it must feel like to think you're being accused of murder when you didn't do a damn thing. It must be terrifying to contemplate being charged for something you didn't do and being incarcerated for the rest of your life. I would be trembling too. In case you may not have realised it, the poor man is grieving the loss of his very best friend. I am as well. People like you lot make insinuations that really are quite dreadful. Take a long, hard look at yourself, officers, in the mirror. How good would you feel about yourselves if you falsely accuse someone of murder? Think about that long and hard, would you? I don't know how things work out in the police station, nor do I know the law, but I know Oliver is innocent. Do you hear me? If Oliver says my son's death is an accident, I a thousand percent believe him, and so should you. No matter how bereft he may feel about his friend cheating on his sister, he would never, and I say never, 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 lay a hand on him. I would stake my life on it. This whole nightmare was an unfortunate accident, and that is that. And if you don't get that, officers, then you're stupider than you look. When Mrs. Hardings had left, the two officers looked at each other in bewilderment. What an extraordinary woman! said Officer Markham. I don't think I've ever met anyone like her. I would be scared to get on her wrong side. I'd certainly want her on my side, that's for sure. Officer Wilson looked at Officer Markham. I believe, Mrs. Harding. I don't think Oliver committed this crime. In fact, I don't think it was a crime at all. When she told us the story about the frog, I knew that Oliver was incapable of harming his friend. He is clearly not the violent type. He hasn't got it in him. Back to Oliver. I'm very glad to inform you that I was never interrogated again by those officers. Even the coroner admitted that the manner of how Thomas died could never ever be fully determined. But it wasn't impossible that he could have been throttled by a bear with just one blow to the head. Granted the case was considered unusual, but then again not everything in life is written in stone. The funeral for my friend Oliver was naturally devastating. No one was more sad than me, Pamela, and both the Hardings. My sister Pamela had received a text that read, 
I'm sitting here with your brother in the wood grove. He had it out with me how much I'd hurt you, Pammy. We made such a commotion together, disturbed all the wildlife, annoyed two British hunters who told us to shut the F up. They weren't best pleased with us having such a brawl. Needless to say, we are sitting here by the water's edge, having made up, enjoying our picnic together. We don't really have the stomach for hunting now. You know your brother anyway. He hates killing anything. Even when I assure him that culling is an important part of managing the deer population. Not a day goes by, Pammy, that I don't think of you. I love you with all my heart. I know I messed up. What I did was reprehensible. I'm truly, truly ashamed. Please have it in your heart to forgive me. My sister was gutted after receiving the text. She said she completely forgave Thomas. It was a year later on the anniversary of his death that me and Mrs Harding decided to go and visit the area by the watering hole where Thomas met his fortuitous end. We decided we would take a picnic with some champagne to celebrate his life, which is exactly what we did. We had notified the lodge of our intentions and they ensured us that no one else was hunting that day out of respect for Thomas. When we arrived at the quaint little lodge, the retired owners welcomed us warmly, expressing their commiserations. Both me and Mrs Harding sprayed ourselves down with the spray hunters use to not be detected by animals. But we did this not for the purposes of hunting, but in the fleeting hope we might spot some wildlife. I had told Mrs Harding the true story about what had happened to her son, and about the Bigfoot, as Mrs Harding had such an open mind, which is a prerequisite for any aspiring artist, that I knew I could tell her anything and she would believe me. I believe you, Oliver, she had said. I know you would never make something up like that. I appreciate why you never told the police about this. By all accounts, it was the most beautiful day, the kind of day that Thomas would have loved. Over the year, Mrs Harding and I had grown even closer, as Thomas's death had cemented our friendship even further, and she was absolutely my second mother without a doubt. As we entered the Woodgrove, it was hauntingly surreal. Suffice to say, going back to the very same place brought the memories flooding back. Wow, this is quite beautiful, gasped Mrs Harding, as we ambled through the viridescent countryside together. I think I'd become a hunter myself to hang around in a place like this all day. Look at that gorgeous fungi. It's an artist's dream. As well as those green mosses and ferns. Oh my word, it truly is Nirvana. She turned around to me and smiled. I'm glad about one thing. If you're going to choose a place where you would breathe your last, this would be a pretty good place to go. Most people are not that lucky. It was so typical of Mrs Harding to see the positive side in everything. She had a great resilience greater than a beach ball in her optimistic attitude towards life that was always expressed in the beautiful colours she incorporated in her art. Before long we were sitting by the lake, and close to the time when Thomas had breathed his last, we both threw flowers into the water and said some words. Hello, darling, said Mrs Harding. I miss you so terribly, sweetheart, but one day I'll see you again. I'm here today with Oliver, celebrating the life you shared with us. You were so beautiful, sweetheart. It was an honour and a privilege to be your mother. We miss you so much. Hello, Thomas, I said. It's me. We miss you, bro. A light has gone out in our lives since you've been gone. You will always be my best friend. The police nearly nailed me for murdering you. I think you will find that very funny. You always did have a sordid sense of humour. But I do miss you, bro. I said a couple of tears welling up in my eyes. Now don't you dare start, said Mrs Harding, pulling out a tissue from her pocket. Or oh, you'll get me blubbing too, she said, dabbing my eyes with the tissues. As me and Mrs Harding were eating our sandwiches, admiring the transfixing views over the silvery water that gleamed in the soft light, very suddenly the forest became inauspiciously quiet, as the bird song seemed to just drift away, melting into the ether like the smoke from a chimney. Then a wind began to whistle between the trees. That was when we heard the booming sound, the sound of heavy feet, that I'd heard a year before. I looked at Mrs Harding in astonishment. It sounds exactly like him. Like who? asked Mrs Harding, looking perturbed. Like the Bigfoot that killed your son by mistake. Mrs Harding tensed, and then bursting through the trees, we saw the Bigfoot. I recognised him at once, although he seemed more mature. Mrs Harding looked astonished. Her eyes grew as round as saucers, 
Her mouth dropped wide open. This was not what she was expecting to see. Neither was I. One thing we had not been anticipating was that this Bigfoot had been expecting us. He had known we were coming, and furthermore, he knew exactly who Mrs. Harding was. Now I ask you, how can such an anomalous creature know such things? Do they have a psychic intuition? I'm not sure, but it seemed like they do. The creature stood up proud and tall, his eyes looking directly at Mrs. Harding, and she looked into his. I watched in amazement as a tear spilled down Mrs. Harding's face. She nodded. That was when I realized that the Bigfoot was speaking to her telepathically. Mrs. Harding nodded again. The Bigfoot ran over to her and put a stone in her hands. It was an amethyst. He looked at me and nodded, and then he glided away. He spoke to you, I said. What did he say? Oh, what a beautiful creature! gasped Mrs. Harding. What a wonderful soul! Those eyes! I've got to paint those eyes! They're so kind! But what did he say to you, Mrs. Harding? He told me that he was expecting me, that I was not to worry about my son. He's very happy, and I'll see him again, and that he's in a very beautiful place. He said he was sorry for what had happened, but he was oblivious to his own strength. He said the stone is to help me connect with my son, so if I hold it and close my eyes, I will see him. Oh my goodness, I gasped. He said all that to you. Yes, he did. You can see he knows things, Oliver, things that humans can't comprehend. Oh, I feel so happy. This calls for a celebration. We must open the champagne. And we did, to celebrate Thomas's life. So every year we went back to the hunting lodge to remember Thomas. But I regret to say we never saw the Bigfoot again. There you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.